పరీక్ష లోకాన్ కర్మచితాన్ బ్రాహ్మణ నిర్వేద మాయా నాస్తి అకృతకృతేన స గురుమేవ విగచ్చేత్ సమిత్పాని శ్రోత్రియ బ్రహ్మనిష్ఠ సీక షుడ్ రిసార్ట్ టు డిటాచ్మెంట్ అండ్ రినౌన్సియేషన్ ఆఫ్టర్ examining the worlds acquired through karma we have acquired this through karma with the help of this maxim there is nothing here that is not the result of karma so what's the need of performing karma for knowing this reality one should with sacrificial fagots go in hand to the guru who is versed in the vedas and who is absorbed in brahman the reality this is a verse from one of the upanishads and good morning to you all thank you thank you for the wonderful song free o oh lord make us free that's really that's a song of the soul freedom but we also know at the same time nothing is free everything is there that we've got to pay for it the air we breathe is free sorry it's not free you keep on breathing some free air you will have to give your longevity your life becomes short if you keep on breathing that there are some beings that breathe very slowly and have a long life so the topic today is bondage and freedom well there are two other hidden words in this what are they suffering and struggles suffering is closer to bondage obviously and struggle is when we try to be free so we have bondage and we have suffering and we have struggles and then we have some freedom so nothing is free yes but then we have this idea of freedom it's divided into two parts there is an external bondage and an internal bondage we'll take up the external bondage first because that is easily comprehensible we call these civic liberties yes if society is bound no great thoughts or no sublime thoughts will ever emerge out of this and if the society is completely free it's going to destroy itself yeah so <laughs> i i believe you all remember these words we hold these truths to be self evident that all men and women are created equal that they are endowed with a creator with certain inalienable rights that amongst these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness well these are extremely sublime grand words and they have been not only molding the destinies of people of this land but all lands very few people can live up to this huge expectations well but is there as they say set in stone and the ideal has to be given to people according to me it is liberty that's central to this if there is no liberty there will be no pursuit of happiness you know what do you what do you live for so liberty is central and as you know one time i had uh, i mean the first time i had come down to the us and i seen the freeway i had seen pictures and you know read about it and i was i used to 
associate the free ways with the, you can say, the way of the free. Oh. But as I got in the freeway, all the, everything was bound by rules, traffic rules. Well, what's, what's free about it? <laughs> Nothing free. But that freedom has to be curbed in order so that we will be safe. So, uh, untrammeled freedom can never exist in society. Society has to build certain walls to protect itself, protect you all, us all. And this is the kind of conflict that goes on. What do we need? F a free society or a society that's clamped down? Well, if you clamp down society, it's like more like a prison house. The people live there. They do everything except that they are not free. Do you want something like that? No. And in a completely free society where anybody can do anything, that too is kind of a dream. And best not imagined and put into practice because each one of us curbs our freedom. When we live in a society, we have to bear and forbear. That has been the guiding principle of society. Everyone, whether they're close up or far away, they take away our freedom. But then, it is essential for growth because we've seen even with all these curves, Society is progressing. We cannot say, yeah, we are not in the Paleolithic or Neolithic age. We are progressing. So freedom in the external world has to be kind of given up a little. Why? Because the sense of responsibility hovers over the sense of freedom in society. And that's important because freedom is growth, freedom is also power. And as we know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. There are some societies that stretch the idea of control over people so much, you know, they talk about equality, everyone is equal. And these ideologies, whether they are sacred or secular, religious or secular, they kind of taper down to a dictator. And there you are. It, we are told how to think and how to behave and how to speak. That's claustrophobic. Yes. Um, uh, of course, there are societies, even today, if you, if you look at North Korea, what exactly is happening there? Yes. And even if the ideology is sacred, you have a religious ideology that says, we are the best and all the rest are, they will criticize that. So somewhere there is a kind of a compromise. We have to compromise on growth and security because each and every individual is given a responsibility. So that uh, my freedom should not curb someone else's freedom. And I can do everything I want to. I'm culturally bound to behave in a kind of a set pattern. So that is what we feel. Bound at the same time, yet free. We have, in the recent times, you have equal opportunities. But then we have freedom of speech and we can vote and we can work, we've got that freedom, yes. And many people do not utilize it properly. We do it sometimes, but sometimes we, you know, as we know, uh, we irritate or anger someone else by our own freedom. So it's necessary in a society 
there has to be some form of bonds. Why is that? Because there's an unconscious social intelligence that protects society. Anything that's detrimental to society, it will veer away from that. It will drop it off. Certain practices in society were silently dropped off as being harmful to society. And this is social intelligence on a massive scale. There is that instinct of self-preservation and self-protection. And we constantly take recourse to this. Well, in the uh, grand scheme of things, what exactly is bondage? Uh, servitude and uh, subjection and enslavement. Yeah. But are these things internal? Yes, they are in both internal and external. That's the reason why we will look at this phenomena from both sides. There is something called, uh, I got a friend around here, hovering around here. <laughs> so, where exactly is bondage? Where there is freedom. You know, you, when you describe something, where exactly is bondage? Yeah, wherever you find bondage, there you will find freedom. Both these are tremendous factors in human lives. And they manifest as pleasure and pain and suffering and joy and sorrow. This whole phenomena that we see around is a result of these two forces acting on the human mind. So you want to be free? Yes. First you've got to feel that bondage. And we do feel bondage. But where exactly do we feel? Yes, physically, mentally, morally, spiritually. Yes, we feel kind of bondage. But there are some people, what's bondage? I'm, I'm a happy person. I'm, I'm exactly what I am. I'm fine. And people have been telling us, be what you are. You are you. Don't change. No. You've got to change. You are under laws. Society reflects nature. Nature works under laws, rigid laws. And yet nature can throw this huge variety of phenomena, this wonderful, you can say, phenomena. So if nature is bound, yet she works through those bonds and gives us this whole universe of life and love. Society also is bound and yet it has been gradually developing itself. So the human mind also has got hundreds of desires and dragging them, yet it rises above desires at times and wants to break free. And if you can understand this, you've understood more than half the world's literature. Yes, they all dwell on these two factors. True stories, true plays, true anything. The underlying scheme is this, bondage and freedom. And how a person suffers to, in bondage and how a person struggles to be free. So this is how we slowly, but there are people who slightly become awakened, as they say. There's a light of consciousness that's growing in them. And for them, these questions become pertinent. What is the nature of freedom? And how do I attain it? So, the opening verse was something like that. So, I need to go to someone who is free already. I cannot go to a bound person and say, free me. <laughs> because Swami Vivekananda says, an iron chain is as strong as a golden one that binds you. You don't replace the iron chain with a gold one. 
Say, I'm fine. No, I've got a gold chain. No, you don't have a gold chain. You're bound. So once we can understand this, this, wherever there is bondage, there is freedom. And this whole universe is a manifestation of these two forces. Rather, it's one force manifesting as two. So, like Swami Vivekananda says, the centrifugal and the centripetal forces are in nature. We want to fly away from something and something drags us back. Yeah, at times you want to throw everything away. Yeah, so you get throw everything and run away. If we can't do that, something or the other holds us back. Duties, and hundreds of things. So here we are, the question is, <clears throat> is this a kind of a post-mortem state? Vedanta says, no. What's the use of it? You know, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, epithet is like, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Wonderful words. But for a Vedantin, oh, post what? I don't want. I want it here and now. If you feel freedom, you've got to experience it fully. You are experiencing, experiencing it in a very kind of uh, subtle way. This has to be increased. And as we increase, we will find that we were always free. So now, we've talked about freedom and bondage as one. Well. Uh, yes, where exactly is this? It's like you know, saying something, Buddha gives the example. A young man, he goes to a village and says, oh, I love her, I love her. I love her, so I'll die without her. And the villagers were all delighted. Here, yeah, come. Who is she? I don't know. Where does she live? I don't know. What's her name? I don't know. Well, Buddha says, what do you call such a guy? Well, he's a fool or he's not even a fool. He's crazy. So, he's saying, whenever you try to define something, it slips out of, of our mental grasp. But yet, we need to locate bondage somewhere. So in the Vivek Chudamani, a kind of primer on Vedanta, a student goes to teacher, and then he asks those great questions. What is this thing called bondage? So he says, what is this thing called bondage? And how has it come over? How has it come? How does it continue to exist? How is one freed from it? What is this non-self? What is this supreme self? These are the questions. So, ko nama bandha katamesha agata katam pratishta katam vimoksha You've got to ask clear questions. How does it continue to exist? Where is it located? The Upanishads say, Mana eva karana bandha moksha. The mind is the cause of both bondage and liberation. Yes. So now we've kind of located this in our minds. And the nature of bondage, when the mind is attached to the objects, Everything, it is bound. Simple as that. The, the song said, free me from attachments. And that's it. And when the mind is disengaged from the objects, it becomes free. Bandha vishaya sakta, moksha nir vishayam svitam. So it is this engagement of the mind with the sense objects that tires down. Sorry. So it's in the mind. And we all have a mind. 
and we all have sensory apparatus, we all struggle, we all suffer. So this is the theme that's kind of common to everyone. Today, as we are progressing to newer and newer levels of society, those who are old enough will see how we have evolving over the years. This sense of freedom should become dominant. Otherwise, there will be, as you say, no? there will always be a kind of problems. And that's why the rise of mental illnesses is growing phenomenally. We are freeing ourselves physically, but our mental illnesses, depression and stress and anxiety, why should society impinge so much on my mind? Is my mind so fragile? Why should it be so fragile? There is something that has not been tapped into. And that is your sense of freedom. The other day, it was yesterday, somebody was asking me, uh, does meditation help you to overcome drug abuse? Oh, wow. Easy. Really? Yes. What happens? When you meditate, your mind matures, it grows large. And all the things that appear in front of you appear small. And that's why you get caught. So right, right now things are very expansive on a mental horizon. And the mind has become kind of cramped. And that's why it can't let go of certain things. When the mind becomes expansive, everything else becomes small then you can easily give it up. You can give up anything, for that matter. So th this student goes, ko nama bandha katamesha agata katam pratishta katam vimoksha. What is this bondage? What is it, what is it called? So, <clears throat> now we say oh, it's, in, it's in the mind. Okay, yeah, it's in the mind. But if you ask, where exactly is the mind? It becomes extremely difficult for people to say, yes, if I ask, do you have a mind? It's obviously. Do I look stupid? <laughs> I have a mind, yeah. What's the nature of the mind? They'll tell you everything about the, about the brain. Yes. But we can exist even beyond the brain. We'll get down to this later on. So, the Upanishads say, Brahman has two forms. Dwe Vava Brahman Arupa. One is defined, one is undefined. All gross matter is defined. You can define it. You can measure it. You can dis dissect it, trisect it, and there stands the wheel. And then we came, come down to the atoms and subatoms and quarks and the various. You can keep on defining it. As certain things are indefinable. And what's that? One of the things is the mind. Yeah. It's like the mind is like water. Take a kind of an illustration. And it fills up any container it's put in, in the glass and a jug in a lake, anything. It takes that form. So right now the mind has taken the form of the body. Where's the mind? It's everywhere in the body. And there is something called the extended mind also. It kind of oozes out. So once we know that this, it, the, the body is here and that the mind is there, the body can't work without a sensory the motor and the, you can say the sensory uh, apparatus. So we need locomotion, we need to think, we need some inputs. 
So here we have the sensory system. So where's the mind? Here. Where exactly now it's located? In the body. So here we start the scriptures say you start with something that you can define, you can hold on to. So what are the physical, you can say bondages? Yes, you see there are plenty of physical bondages. You know, there is poverty. Apart from food and sleep, etc. Poverty and death and kind of loneliness. These are bondages, real bondages. And we constantly suffer them and we struggle to eradicate these bondages. And that's the reason why we work so that we can be physically free from these kind of bondages. Speech. Yeah, sometimes speech reveals. You know? that's, that's the idea of speech. But at times speech becomes deceptive. We can deceive people through words. And it's a powerful medium. And we do that to deceive ourselves also. That's the problem. So speech is another thing that it is a, you need to keep it straight, pure, and without any kind of deception. Because that is what liberates us, also binds us. Keep that in mind. Emotional, oh yeah. Even if we are, we've got, we are free from that, we've got a nice house and a car and we've got everything. Yet we are so sad. We have a low self-esteem and nobody loves me. And another half of the world's literature is nothing but trying to explain what is love and why you, why you should love and why you are very lovely. Huh. Somehow we have failed to understand that love is an expression of freedom. Yes, but then we use that very love to bind other people. Yeah. This has to be under my control. Sit and sit. Well, you know, mm, the mind is so kind of uh, crazy. There are people who can be at a drop of a hat be hypnotized in five seconds. And you tell them, well, you're a bird now. And that great person will keep on flapping his wings. What happened? Just a suggestion has gone into the mind and that person believes. So beliefs, belief systems have to be carefully looked at. Scrutinize them. Just because you've been told a thing over and over again doesn't mean you throw your intellect out and say, yeah, this is what I believe. No. Question it. It's extremely important to question the beliefs. Most of the tyranny that we see in this world is due to beliefs. One person's belief countering somebody else's beliefs. Beliefs. And this becomes even worse when they, they become religious beliefs. Oh, then so many worlds, battles and wars and aggression was a result of beliefs. So beliefs are a kind of a bondage and also a source of liberation. Then we have you know, things that we have done, all things they come back to us to haunt us. Yes, I, I generally give an example. We've been discarding plastic all over. Ah, plastics have saved forests. Plastics is, has saved humanity, really. And it's coming back to us. It's all over the place, in our food, in our bodies, in our hair, everywhere. 
as microplastics, small kind of nano sized plastics are going back. You discard it, you threw it out, it's come back to you. It has to. That's the law of the nature. What you, you have done has come back to you, not aware of it. It's there sleeping in the mind. So, what do you do now? Well, you can break the old bondages, moral bondages. Yes, of course. If bondage and liberation are one and the same thing, yeah, we can. But there are times we don't want to. We close our eyes to it. It's okay. It's not my problem. That's, that's a government problem. That's it. But now things are becoming serious. We need to look at this kind of boomerang effect. You throw a boomerang, it comes back to you. And if you're not uh, careful, it might hit you on the head there. So, every good thought that we have sent breaks an old chain. Yeah. And every suspicious thought, evil thought, thoughts of greed and anger and hate, they too have come back to us. And they are the causes of bondage. So, we need to kind of get out of that shadow and we can do it once you understand this is where I need to break these chains. As uh, we can say, part of this is memories. We have laid down memories over lifetime, over and over again. If we look back at our own life, it seems like a dream. Yes, my whole life in retrospect is kind of, kind of dreamlike. But these memories, they are powerful enough, though they are, appear dreamlike, they are powerful enough to mold our characters. They are powerful enough to orient us. And all the things that we feel, all the phobias. What's a phobia? It's an overreaction to some kind of stimulus that I was afraid of. It's just overreaction. It's nothing to be frightened about. Something had kind of frightened me. Maybe a spider. I saw a spider and <gasps> yeah, there. And I and now I overreact. That's a, this is of course a part of the subconscious mind which is called Uddharanam. Some certain impressions become expanded. Certain impressions are sleeping, certain impressions are attenuated. Certain impressions form a network in the mind. So all these memories are there. Old things that I have done. When I am trying to sit down and meditate, 20 years ago, somebody has said, you are a fool. And that pops up in my mind. See? And I get annoyed. Why? You are supposed to meditate now. <laughs> It's memories that kind of bind you. And then we have, you know, the intellect. We are grand people. We are so intelligent. And everything speaks of intelligence and order. But there's another side of intellect that's called the chaotic side. Chaos. Yes. We extract order from chaos. And we try to live in a kind of an ordered society. When we have an intelligence, we can become kind of, you know, ordered. We can uh, work logically. We can use the rules of logic to proceed further, to arrive at truth. The intellect is absolutely necessary. And in the human beings with this neocortex, we are remarkably endowed with intelligence but at the same time a little crooked intelligence you know we have some very intelligent crooks you know? <laughs> all these scamsters and all they are quite very intelligent they can it can manipulate facts 
And they say there's no truth, there are only facts. And they become uh, kind of selective in taking facts and presenting it to you. That is a danger. So the intellect deludes you as well as liberates you also. So that was Ko Nama Bandha. What is the nature of bondage? The second question is, Katamesha Agata, where has this bondage come from? Obviously. That's the second part of the question. Well, I just spoke about nature's bondage. And the human body and the mind also is a part of nature. That is what we need to first understand. We are part of nature. Not only that, we are nature. It is called Prakriti or Maya. On the cosmic scale, it is called Maya. She brings out this variety of life. At least here you can see that. And, of course, that products of that nature are also in my body and mind. So on the individual level, it's called non-knowledge. Nature hides truth. And here in my mind also, nature kind of hides truth. Why does she do that? Yeah, that's her business. And like we began this session with a prayer, yeah, you approach that Divine Mother and pray. So, the Bhagavad Gita says that these three, the, there are three products of nature, Sattva and Rajas and Tamas. They bind the embodied one fast to this world. Sattva Rajas Tamas Iti Guna Prakriti Sambhava Nibadhnanti Mahabhava Deha Dehinsmin. So, Deha Dehinsmin. So, <coughs> We are bound by nature. So we are a complement of nature, bondage and freedom, and the soul, which is called the Atman, which is a free agent. We are talking about uh, bondages. And people also talk about, the, we, we've got a free will. Well, no. Your will is bound by your own subconscious. One good thing that Sigmund Freud did was showed that there is a subconscious. Your will is bound by the subconscious. It can be free. Then saying, okay, I can cure my subconscious. Well, will is what I know. And what I know is bound by the laws of time, space and causation. The will is bound. There is no free will. There is something called a choice. You choose between one and the other. There is no free will. But then, what do I feel? I can work this out. Yeah. That is an agency which is even beyond the will, beyond the intellect, beyond the mind. It kind of oozes out into these bodies and minds and senses and that's why we have this feeling of freedom. So, Katam Pratishta, how does it continue to exist? Okay, we find nature binds us. Yeah. Good enough. It would have been easy. And nature also tries to liberate us by letting us go through experiences. The, you can say, the Sankhya philosophy, one of the oldest philosophies, they speak about what is nature's work? She takes you through experiences and then releases you, bhoga and apavarga. It's like you are sitting there reading a book, you turn page after page after page. Who has changed? The book, of course, and you too. You have gone through these various pages and you've gained experience. 
And after you have gained experience, you are set free. Get out now. But then in Indian philosophy, this is the goal of humankind. What is that? Moksha, freedom. It is a bounden duty to orient ourselves towards this. If you take one life, good enough. If you want two, take it. Three, four, five, hundred thousand, a million lives, take it. But get free. That's the idea. See, what happens is, but it has to be kind of established on dharma. The old Indian scheme of life was, a person follows the rules of religion or spirituality, establish himself or herself in spirituality. He goes through a long course of studies and then pursues, as they say, money and this and that. Yes, wealth and everything was not looked down. Oh, by the way, today is a very auspicious day. Come for Today is the worship of the Divine Mother as wealth, Lakshmi. It's Lakshmi Puja. The Divine Mother is worship for wealth, spiritual wealth as material wealth and all types of wealth. So here you are, you know what to do now. So wealth was not looked down upon, oh this guy is filthy rich. It's okay. And then, enjoyments. You see, there are legitimate enjoyments. You must be enjoyed. I like chocolate ice cream, so you know, why should I deny myself that pleasure? It's harmless. <laughs> there are legitimate, otherwise, life will become dry and kind of, it will great on your nerves all the time. So there has to be, life is supposed to be enjoyed. Why should you take a long face and go down, down the street, Swami Vivekananda say, whenever you are morose, you have a long face, don't go out, it's a disease. <laughs> and people think that if you are religious, you've got to put a long face. Then what, I asked one guy, what is this long face, somber face? Is it a religious face? Yes, yes, Swami. It's a religious face. I said, you're wrong. <laughs> a religious face will always be sparkling and full of fun and joy. Religion is supposed to be a joyous pursuit. Not something so painful. And, oh my God. I've got to get up in the morning, early morning that too. No, you're good. It's, it's really joyful. So these are legitimate things that until unless you don't go through it, you don't mature. You go through it and then the last, the goal post is <laughs> moksha, freedom. That's the spirit. So dharma, artha, kama and moksha was supposed, one person, every person rather, was supposed to Traverse this path. You have to attain moksha. This is what's the goal of life? Eat, drink, and sleep? No. That's sorry. That's nothing, nothing great about it. The animals also do it. So what's what distinguishes you from them? Dharma. That is. So moksha, one must. And that's the reason why, you know. In India, we'll try every kind of shortcut to get to that. Yeah, when you know time's running out, get it. And in the, in, you know, there's something called the Kumbh Mela, the, 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 the fair of the, you can say, the pot of nectar. And they say that if you have a holy dip in the Ganga river, at that particular time, at that particular place, you'll be free. 
and people rush and millions and millions of people go. There is some urge for freedom. It shows, it expresses itself like that. We all have that urge. We all are actually, rather I will say, nature is leading us toward that. But times, you know, we are in no hurry. And nature pushes us a little. And then you say, oh, this is, this is rubbish. I want my freedom. And nature says, yeah, you go towards freedom. I'm pushing you towards that. No, I want it my way. <laughs> so, moksha is supposed to be a goal. Sri Ramakrishna says, the goal of human life is to see God. God? Yes. So isn't it silly? Now? Yes. Not later? No. Now. If you can't do it now, you might not get it later. Chances are you might have to come back again. <laughs> so, once we are orient, you know what happens like, Take, for instance, the hippie movement. They are kind of disgruntled with certain aspects of society. And uh, let's have a kind of a counter movement. It was, and they called it a spiritual movement. It was nothing spiritual. They were disgruntled. And then fizzled out. Has to. They want to be free, free, free. You can't become free through this kind of angst. You need to work yourself out through these bondages and emerge out like that silkworm spins a cocoon around itself and in that bondage as I say it develops as it matures it breaks free and emerges out this is how we need to work so over the years we have been kind of following these things in a very subconscious way. We need to do it consciously. That's the whole thing. Yes. And not only that, the scriptures say it is your birthright. Birthright? Yes. Freedom is your birthright. You are born to be free. It's a tremendous statement. Vedanta says, <coughs> so, these three qualities of nature, when the mind is kind of purified, when it's light and joyous, that too is a part of nature. It binds the soul through pursuit of knowledge and happiness. Sukha sange nabadnasi, jnana sange. It binds the soul with knowledge. And with happiness. There are some, some souls, you know, they are like kind of happy and uh, very kind of soft and pure and luminous. But that also is a bondage. Rajo ragatmikam vidhi trishna sanga samudbhavam. So the other quality of nature is passion, activity, hunger, thirst, running about. It binds a soul through karma. I work and I get bound. So what? I, this is my work, my bondage. So I'll come out of it. But one bondage leads to the next and the next and the next. And here we are caught. And the other, the last quality of nature is called tamas, darkness, ignorance, kind of insolence and stupidity. It binds the soul through stupidity and sleep and laziness and languorous feeling. Ah, take it easy. Let the whole world go to the dogs. I'll take it easy. <laughs> so these qualities are also called ropes. There's another meaning which is called guna means the qualities of nature as well as the ropes of nature, it binds the soul to this. So as we come down to this idea of freedom, 
What exactly? So we've seen katam pratishta, katam vimoksha. How does how is one free from it? How do you, well? There is one part which you've got to look at. What is that? That's the sense of the self, the I, the ego. It is here that one has to kill that demon. It's easy. So you catch that, sir. This is the very root from which emerge all the other things. The sense of the self. But then the sense of the self, yes. It is necessary. It's necessary. But to a certain limit only. After that, uh, that has to be given up. And that's the reason why it's asked, what is this non-self? The question is, Kosava Anatma. What is this? It is a non-self. You see, in Vedanta, you cannot have many selves. You have to have one self. One absolute self for Atman. And that is appearing as this multitude. So this technically is the non-self. Towards the very end of this discourse of the Vek Chodamani, the student, he goes through that discipline and then he kind of yells to his teacher, where has this universe gone? I just experienced it and now it's all over. And that is the kind of a joyous shout that emerges out. Kutra leenam idam jagat adunaiva mayadrishtam nastiki mahadbhutam It's a great wonder. I just experienced this all through and now it's all over. It's gone. So what does that student experience then? That student has a transcended nature and realizes that absolute freedom, that bondage, from bondage, that absolute self. So we are a combination of both bondage and freedom. Yes, bondage is nature and freedom is that Atman, that soul of yours. We all are a combination of these two entities. And once we start identifying ourselves with that higher self of us, not the ego, the higher self, the Atman, then bondage simply drops. Nature does not anymore try to hold you down. But how can this which is finite nature, can it bind the infinite? Well, actually, it can't. They give an example of, you take a mirror and you put a red flower in front of it. The mirror is stupid in thinking that I'm red. I'm a red flower. Who told you you're a red flower? You're a mirror. And then you take a white, uh, a white flower and say, I'm, I'm a white flower. There. It is true, something called an error, a non-knowledge a jnana, non-knowledge. Kind of a misperception. And Vedanta says, if all these things is just to kind of a, a, due to a misperception. You are taking that rope for a snake. Well, the snake has to be where the rope is. You cannot have a rope there and a snake out there. Both are there together. One is the foundation, the basis of the other. So the reality and illusion appear together. Wherever there is bondage, cut through and hold down that. So you perceive the snake, but it's a misperception. You bring in the light and say, oh, oh I was frightened of it. Why? It was a rope all the, all the while. So, that misperception is eradicated. That is the only thing that you need to do. 
correct perception but then yes we need to start from a much lower level start from the physical level straight to speech and to the mind to the morality to memories to intellect emotion all these things so like buddha says there is no one to help you his one of his final words was there is no one to help you work out diligently your own salvation your own liberation so yeah we got to diligently work out but there are some people oh, i'm feeling that kind of bondage and it's like the head is on fire the person is rushing towards a body of water to a lake or something to douse that a person feels bondage like that if you can feel it like that you will become free it's as easy as that because our value system has to kind of orient ourselves from the present to the ideal if you have a different value system we are going to go in different directions you put the highest value on freedom everything will fall into place that's it's as simple as that we have put enough emphasis on bondage yeah we need to shift as i say uh, perception and then oh why do we have to do all this thing can't somebody help us yes we can and the opening song itself is saying oh lord free me but where is the lord <laughs> i've been weeping and praying and crying for that lord to free me and doesn't seem to come in our vespers hymns there is a how great was your sacrifice freely choosing your birth in this prison our iron age to unchain us and set us free whenever you pray weep for liberation the lord responds there is no doubt at all but we haven't been too serious enough be serious pray and you see the lord answering the question at times the lord comes down in the form that we can recognize and hear and see and understand comes like us and in the lives of these great incarnations you find them behaving exactly like we do with all our bondages yet there is an element in them that transcends all bondages that is what they come to teach us so in the life of ram krishna you find this he was kind of an ordinary person like us subject to everything yet that great you can see transcendence was there so when we correct the perceptions we become free what is called vedanta calls the jivan mukti it is free while yet living you will find your real self transcending everything and this is what so this transcendence takes two forms one is the subconscious mind has to transform itself yes because that the old old bondages old karma and old feelings and thoughts are all stored up there so the subconscious mind has to first transmute transform itself and then the conscious mind also has to transform itself into super consciousness so there has to be a kind of alignment there if there's an alignment we are free there is no alignment between our thoughts and words and deeds or the subconscious the conscious and the super conscious is a superconscious is a kind of a waiting for us what's wrong with this guy it's only when we the conscious mind is transformed to spiritual practices 
to thinking of freedom to correcting our mistakes will we get oriented towards this higher this higher mind is a kind of a gateway to freedom it's a royal road and where is that do you have to go from here to downtown no it's here inside here you plunge in that's the place where you can get a glimmer of freedom and it's that glimmer which was kind of motivating you impelling you to live although why bother living who wants to live like this kind of bound in the prison house this is what gives you a sense of you can say joy it gives you a sense of happiness it makes you wake up every day and do those same drab things that you're doing yeah, yeah. amazing once we know this that is what is actually a real you can say center of gravity we need to pull ourselves from that ego back to the sense of freedom in ourselves and we will be free om shanti 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 hi hari hi om tat sat Shri Ram Krishna Panamastu Yo Brahmanam Vidadati Purvam Yo Vai Vedansha Prahinoti Tasmai Tam Hadevam Atma Buddhir Prakasham Mumukshur Vai Sharanamaham Prapadhi He who at the beginning of creation projected Brahma, that is the universal consciousness, and who delivered the Vedas to him, the Vedas is that universal knowledge. Seeking liberation, I go for refuge unto that effulgent one whose light turns my understanding towards the Atman, the Self within. So this is the prayer that all Vedantins can sit, utter before and after their studies. It's just that kind of, you need help and yes, it's there. You push your hand out and then you'll see somebody holding it here. The Lord is that agent which is constantly working to liberate us. If we take a refuge in that, well, we are liberated. Peace, peace, peace.